Hello, and welcome to 37th and the World, the official podcast of the Georgetown Journal of International Affairs. Gajia is a student-run flagship publication of Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service. On 37th and the World, we dive into key global trends and speak directly with the experts working on the issues in areas ranging from conflict and security, human rights and development, science and technology, society and culture, business and economics, and global governance. Beginning November 2022, China faced massive demonstrations contesting the strict zero-COVID policies that left many citizens constrained within their homes and short of necessary materials. Multiple protests erupted in response to conditions faced by China's workforce, including violent clashes in Zhengzhou against authority figures at the world's largest iPhone factory. In this interview, Jujia sat down with Eli Friedman, associate professor at Cornell University, to discuss the context and ramifications of these protests, as well as broader insights about the state of Chinese labor and its relation to the broader world. To begin our interview, what originally compelled you to research and write on labor politics in China? How has this focus shaped your understanding and analysis of labor elsewhere? For example, you serve as the advisor to the Cornell ILR labor action tracker that documented U.S. labor strikes in 2020 and 2021. I've been interested in Chinese labor issues for a long time. It goes back uh, about 20 years. And at the time, I was an undergraduate and it was the so-called anti-globalization movement. There was protests against the World Trade Organization, the IMF, the World Bank, and all of that. And I had that as a kind of political interest. And I had this academic interest in Chinese history, and I was a history major as an undergrad. Um, And then in 2002, I traveled to China after graduating college, and I was there to continue learning the language. and met all of these workers, migrant workers, especially who would come into the city of Beijing um, to try to improve their livelihood. And I realized that I could bring these two interests together, my interest in China and my interest in questions of of globalization and labor issues. Um, And so that's that's really how 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 I got interested in it and have been focusing on it one way or another for the past 20 years, I think that the perspective of Chinese labor is one of the most critical insights on the process of globalization or global capitalism more broadly. Uh, And there are, of course, important implications, not just for China, but for the rest of the world. And in fact, uh, to answer the the second part of your question, um, my research in China has uh, has really shaped how I understand um, politics and labor issues in other parts of the world as well. So you mentioned the Cornell ILR Labor Action Tracker, um, which is a project that I've been involved with and, and helped to start back in 2020. The way that that project actually got off the ground was a friend of mine made an offhanded remark um, saying that we should do something for the United States that was similar to China Labor Bulletin's strike map. Now, this is a project that China Labor Bulletin started, uh, I think, about 10 years ago uh, to try to create a database of strikes and protests by workers in China. Of course, the Chinese government doesn't have any official data on on any of this. One of the interesting things about the United States is that uh, since 1982, the Bureau of Labor Statistics has actually barely kept data on strikes. They only capture strikes that involve more than a thousand workers and last for a shift or more. And so that excludes the vast majority of of strike activity that happens in the U.S. And we we sort of suspected that there was a lot of um, a less formal strike and protest activity that was happening in the U.S. that wasn't being captured. And in some ways that parallels what's happened in China, where also there's no no right to strike and, and the government doesn't announce any data. Um, and so we got in touch with people from China Labor Bulletin. They told us how they do the strike map, how they do the data collection, all of that. Uh, and so they are a very direct inspiration for that for that U.S. Uh, based project. In fall of 2022, you wrote up the closed loop zero COVID-19 strategy that Chinese policymakers used to constrain labor to their workplaces 
while simultaneously ensuring the smooth flow of capital from production centers. Is this closed loop method entirely unique to the COVID-19 pandemic, or have you found there to be precedent to this biopolitical managerialism? So the first thing to say is that uh, closed loop like uh, management arrangements are not unique to China during COVID. Uh, and I'll just reference a couple other places. I think that in some ways, the first closed loop that we saw during COVID was in the US um, with the NBA bubble, um, which was the way that the NBA uh, conducted the playoffs uh, and the finals. Um, they they went down to, to Florida and they had this, what they called the bubble, where basically as few people uh, came in as possible and they tried to prevent the players, uh, coaches, you know, people, the medical professionals, et cetera, from leaving. Um, there are similar kinds of arrangements, particularly for migrant workers that we saw in places like Taiwan uh, and in Singapore uh, during, uh, during COVID. Um, so within the context of the pandemic, certainly nobody has done it on the scale or with the intensity that China has done it, but uh, it, it does appear in other kinds of places. If we're thinking about non-pandemic closed loop-like arrangements, um, I think the, the closest analogy is actually prison labor, um, which of course has appeared in all kinds of places all over the world for, you know, for millennia or, or however since, since the dawn of, uh, of human civilization. Um, and it's similar in the sense that uh, you have people who are in prisons or might physically leave the prison, but of course be under intense surveillance while they're out. Um, and they are supposed to be economically uh, productive while um, the state uh, exercises complete control over their, their bodily movement. Um, <clears throat> and so this, this idea that the state will exercise some kind of control over the movement of workers is not at all uh, unique um, to China. Um, I do think that it's... Um, it is more, I've already said it's more uh, extensive and, and a bit more um, extreme in terms of how tightly it's policed in the context of, of China's COVID management. Um, but it's it's really also only possible in a situation where the state maintains at least the possibility for this kind of dictatorial control over bodily movement. And you can't invent that out of nothing, right? So in order to understand how it is that the Chinese state and Chinese uh, corporations, or at least companies that are, that are based in China, the, you know, we, we can't understand how they're able to implement the closed loop system without looking at the whole historical development of the way that migrant workers are treated within China. Um, and we can see that there has always been that, that kind of a potential. If you look at the, the the even the architectural arrangement of facilities like Foxconn, where they are gated, where most, if not all, of the workers are living in on-site dormitories, um, and where where the companies and the police work very closely, um, they've always had that ability to really tightly control the lives of their workers. Mostly, it's being oriented; it's oriented towards meeting production deadlines, but they have that kind of, in the case of Foxconn, they have that architecture in place, but they also have uh, kind of institutional arrangements in place where it's very, it's relatively easy anyway to um, to dep deprive people of that freedom. Um, you know, the NBA bubble is different. Uh, the United States obviously doesn't, or, or the state of Florida doesn't exercise that kind of dictatorial control over, uh, you know, LeBron James. Um, it's a weird case because they have a ridiculous amount of money and, and everybody's being paid a ridiculous amount of money to stay in that bubble. So th there's different kinds of pathways, I think. You also mentioned the Trang's Collective's book, Social Contagion, in that article. He specifically recalled how everyday people during the pandemic in China adopted bottom-up resistant methods amidst data capacity. In your own studies of Chinese workers, such as your most recently published book, the urbanization of people, the politics of development, labor markets, and schooling in a Chinese city. How have you witnessed this type of oppositional social organization from below? It's a, a common misconception um, that the Chinese state is really centralized and that all kinds of social activities uh, can only happen if you know Beijing approves of it. 
in part that misconception is because of the Chinese state's own presentation of itself as highly centralized, as highly competent, uh, as able to manage things on a scale and at a level of detail that other states can't dream of. Um, but the reality is that Chinese society is vast, it's complicated, and there is a huge amount of um, social activity that exceeds the direct control of the state, be it the central state or even, even local governments. And of course, there's also frequently uh, differences in opinion and difference in strategies between a cent central state uh, and local governments. That's been a recurrent theme in lots of political science and, and sociology um, on China. Uh, one of the things that I found in a lot of my research was, um, which was focused on the, the issue of education for rural to urban migrant workers, was that you you frequently have a, a situation where where these migrant workers are coming into cities, and the cities are not providing public education to their children because they're not considered citizens when their household registration is located in a rural area. Going back to the 1990s, a lot of these communities were coming together and pooling their own resources to start these informal schools. Um, some of them were were better uh, and and were really communities doing their best uh, to, to make something out of nothing. A lot of them became also profit-oriented businesses and were somewhat exploitative towards their uh, towards the teachers and not necessarily providing quality education. So both of these things were happening. But what we saw is that the, the question of provision of education, if you look at just you know the, the national level of education laws, they're very clear that everyone has um, compulsory education, grades one through nine, it's supposed to be free. Official government policy since the early 2000s has been for rural to urban migrant workers to be placed into public schools. But the reality on the ground is just that those things are not being implemented. And so in those kinds of situations, um, you see Chinese society mobilizing to provide the things uh, to the communities that it needs. Um, it's, a different, it's different in some significant ways from what happened um, in the Wuhan lockdown, which was, which was documented in, the, in that book. Um, uh, but it's there are some some similarities as well, which is to say that whether we're looking at the Wuhan lockdown, whether we're looking at provision of education for rural to urban migrants, these are not things that the state can accomplish in a completely dictatorial and top down way. That and this shouldn't come as a surprise to, to people who live in any other society on earth that actually you need some kind of coordination between state and society in order for social policies to actually be effective. Um, and you can see that in lots of different kinds of realms. Recently at Tegia, we published an article on the outsourcing of Chinese surveillance and public security systems to countries in Africa. Do you see other countries adopting similar methods of labor control as a closed loop system in China? For example, at the end of Escape from the Closed Loop, you concluded that the aspirations and struggles in China are part and parcel with demands by migrant workers and dispossessed peoples around the world to abolish the logic of borders and escape the closed loop of capital. Perhaps, just as Harsha Walia argues in Border and Rule, global migration, capitalism, and the rise of racist nationalism, the world economy and migration system already acts as a bit of a closed loop by restraining labor and letting loose the reins of capital across borders. Yeah, so I think that if if we look at the, the big picture globally, um, one of the tendencies that we see over the last, say, 30 years, uh, 40 years, is that there's been all of these steps taken by governments and corporations to enhance mobility for, for capital and for commodities, but to place more constraints on the movement uh, of people. You can see this in lots of contexts, right? It doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be in the Chinese context. Of course, in, in the United States and you, the immigration question is one of the central social problems that we're facing. The clearest example of this, I think, for Americans is you have the North American Free Trade Agreement passed, uh, enacted in 1994 which allows for the free movement of capital and commodities between the US and Mexico. And over that same period of time, you see, you see enhanced migration, but also enhanced efforts at policing the border, um, which have 
uh, in many ways become more militarized and more violent over the years, right? And so that's really the kind of a core juxtaposition that characterizes the contemporary global political economy. It's got lots of different instantiations and lots of different places. Um, but there is, in many places, states have this, they have fears about, you know, some kind of contamination from workers. And that contamination can be epidemiological um, or it can be other kinds of, you know, imagined social uh, contamination or undermining of, of uh, existing social services or what have you. China is different um, in, in a lot of ways. Two of the key ways that I that I think it's different from our understanding in the American context um, is first that this entire system of migration is happening within a country. So it's not international migration. It's rural to urban migration within a country. Um, and the second part is that the, the people that are being subjected to various kinds of exclusion or partial inclusion, they're people who are brought into the cities as workers, but not uh, being brought in as as full full citizens, they're being uh, denied access to social services. That that subpopulation are formally full citizens of the country, and it's also not racialized. And this is, I think, pretty significant. Right, we're talking about Han people, and these differences make it a little bit difficult for Americans to grasp because when we think about exploitation, uh, when we think about uh, migration and policing of borders, we think of a racialized population and we think about this being deployed against um, non-citizens, right? Um, but it, it's important for us to understand that that citizenship operates uh, in, in different kinds of ways uh, in, in the Chinese context. We also need to be attentive to different kinds of social difference. And so in China, the region that you come from in your place of household registration plays a similar kind of role to citizenship or race in the Euro-American context. Um, and to different ways that borders or, or, or limitations on human mobility um, can actually be uh, realized, that it doesn't have to just be a physical border between two nation states. It doesn't have to be ice raids that Americans might, might think about. Um, but it can be denial of access to subsidized housing. It can be denial of access to public education or subsidized health care. And that's the way that rural migrants uh, who have to go to urban China for work, that's the way that they experience uh, controls uh, on their mobility. So that's just kind of as, as background to, to really answer your initial question about the, the closed loop. I don't think that the, the closed loop per se, is going to happen elsewhere. Um, it just requires too much control, right? And the Chinese state is, there are lots of ways that it's not exceptional, but one of the ways that it is exceptional is that it just has more capacity to realize these kinds of things than, than just about any other government on earth. Um, but I do think, um, based on what I've just said about uh, the, the U.S. system anyway, that we, that we see similar kinds of dynamics, right, where there's again, enhanced mobility for, for capital and commodities and less mobility, less freedom of movement uh, for people. One of the clearest examples is uh, these guest worker programs that we see in many countries around the world. The United States has it on a relatively small scale. Here we have a much larger undocumented worker um, workforce, um, but there are very large guest worker programs uh, in Canada uh, in the Gulf states, in the UAE, in Qatar, um, in in Asian countries like in Singapore, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, um, Hong Kong has a very large guest worker program. And all of these places seek to bring people in as workers. There is no path to citizenship. They expressly do not enjoy the same um, political or social rights uh, as full citizens. And in, in most cases, there's a limited term that they're allowed to be in the country. At a certain point, they have to leave. And this is an effort to, on the part of these countries to avoid what they see as some of the failures of um, immigration plans in the U.S. and in Western Europe, where immigrants come, they work, but then they end up staying, right? And so these guest worker programs are really about 
bringing people in, having them work, and then sending them on their way. So again, it's not a closed loop in the sense that they can't leave their place of work, but I think it reveals the same kind of logic, which is a certain kind of quarantining of the imagined social problems that come with labor migrants. Do you see any potential pathways toward transnational worker solidarity movements between those in China and elsewhere emerging from these recent protests? Or would you take a more hesitant view? After all, in the United States, union membership dropped to a record low in 2022, despite widespread high-profile coverage in the support of organized labor in recent years. Extremely difficult right now for a few reasons. Um, as you've just suggested, on the U.S. side, uh, union membership continues to drop the labor movement despite having some positive signs of revival here and there is overall um, not strong politically. Uh, and I would say largely the, the major American unions are pretty inwardly focused. Um, that's not to say all of them. There, there's some differences and some, some people who are more internationally oriented. Um, but I think that the general assessment is we have plenty of problems here at home. And so it, there's a kind of nationalist tinge, I think, to the official labor movement. The other reason why it's extremely difficult uh, is extreme levels of political pressure, repression in China uh, right, right now. So 10 years ago, there were many more possibilities. The labor activists and trade unions actually were going back and forth between China and the US. There were official delegations between the Chinese, the state-run union, and some American and other foreign union federations. There was a growth of uh, labor NGOs, uh, labor researchers, and, and centers for the study of labor at Chinese universities. Basically, all of that has disappeared under Xi Jinping. <clears throat> and activists are facing all kinds of repression. Any kind of uh, engagement with foreign actors, except for corporations, um, can in can lead to severe repression in China. So if you've certainly if you've received funding from any foreign foundations or foreign NGOs, um, that can get you branded as co collaborating with so-called hostile foreign forces. Um, <clears throat> but even you know even doing a research project with foreigners uh, is enough to get um, activists within within China in, in some trouble. Um, and so it is It is extremely, extremely difficult. All that being said, uh, I do think that there are at least two possibilities um, about how to deal with this question of um, solidarity between workers in, in the U.S. and China or, or China and the rest of the world more broadly. The first is what I think of as um, anticipatory solidarity. So understanding that people in China are not in a position to reciprocate. They might not even be in a position to acknowledge that um, that we are sending some sort of signals uh, about you know being on the same side of whatever struggle it, 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 they might be uh, facing. Um, but in fact, a lot of the problems that workers in China and the U.S. face um, are quite similar. Um, you know, low wages uh, uh, being a big one for workers everywhere all the time. Lack of access to decent health care, lack of access to, to, to decent housing, repressive workers who are firing people for, uh, you know, for union activities. Um, <clears throat> all of those things are, are quite similar. Oftentimes, workers in China and the U.S. are even employed by the same company. So a lot of American companies uh, have huge uh, operations in China, such as Tesla, Walmart, um, it, uh, and many companies also have extensive uh, supply chains, so they don't directly employ people, but are responsible for the employment of lots of people in China, including also Walmart, um, but you know Apple, uh, Nike. I mean, just about any company is is producing lots of goods there. So there is this kind of direct uh, connection. This isn't just kind of at the level of idealism. Um, so I think for the for the time being, unfortunately, it had. These, these kind of expressions of solidarity might be a bit of a one-way street. Um, it, it might kind of have to remain at the level of symbolism, again, because it's so dangerous. But people within China are able to see this. Of course, there is a lot of online censorship, <clears throat> but particularly for activists, intellectuals, students, they do have the means for accessing information from outside of China. Um, and they it's important for them to see um, those kinds 
uh, those kinds of connections. Uh, the second thing that I think is worth considering is organizing within the Chinese diaspora. Um, I've experienced that Chinese students in particular have had a real political awakening over the last year, uh, in part due to the severity of the lockdowns, in part because of disenchantment with Xi Jinping and the fact that he's made himself um, leader for life. And so I think that Chinese students and Chinese immigrants in this country are open to new kinds of political activism that was not the case um, just a couple of years ago. And I think that people that are in the US should engage with them. Um, if China is going to become less repressive and more tolerant of worker organizing, um, then the diaspora uh, is definitely going to play a key role in, in terms of um, intellectual leadership, in terms of bridging um, the, the, the divide between these two societies. Before we end, would you like to make any last comments? Well, I should address the U.S.-China relations as kind of the backdrop to all this. And, and of course, U.S.-China relations are pretty awful. Um, and I think even absent, uh, you know, any more surveillance balloons or any surprises like that, it seems unlikely that things are going to improve anytime soon, given the kind of structural rivalry that we see developing between the two of them. Um, and so th this idea of facilitating a sense of solidarity between people in the U.S. and, and China against this backdrop, I think, is very hard, but also increasingly necessary. Um, <clears throat> one of my aims has always been to draw points of similarity um, between these two countries, um, places that I've spent many years living um, and uh, and care you know deeply about. Um, and it's just a straightforward proposition that people in the US and China share much more in common with each other than they do with the respective elites in these places. Um, and I've already talked about some of the, the core economic concerns that people in both places have about, uh, you know, wages are not high enough, rent is too high, people have uh, pr concerns about precarity in the labor market, about being able to save enough to put their kids through school. I mean, these are just basic problems that people share. Of course, there's the existential threat uh, of climate change that we all share with each other. And I think, hopefully, we share a desire to avoid a war, which would, would be catastrophic, I think, for all for all people involved. Um, so, you know, the, the stuff, if we, if we think about the stuff on, on the closed loop, which is where we started, um, in some ways that is exceptional. It seems like a, a China specific problem. There were no closed loops here in the United States. But I do think that, uh, again, in the, in the spirit of drawing connections and drawing out some of the similarities and shared interests, that this question of non-local workers being treated as if they're disposable and exploitable, um, that's not unique to one place or the other. I think that that's something that a lot of people uh, in the United States will, will recognize and, and should resonate with them. Um, and so I really hope that, that folks will continue to, to pay attention to some of these issues and, and see these kinds of connections as a way of establishing uh, commonality across borders. This was 37th and the World. Thank you to Eli Friedman. Please be sure to subscribe, leave a comment and rating on whichever streaming platform you use. Read this interview and other insightful interviews and articles, please check out gia.georgetown.edu. Thank you for listening, and see you next time.